Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is Muhammad Jalal and welcome to the Thinking Muslim podcast. Today we're talking Ertugul. Ertugrul, for those of you who haven't seen it, and I can't imagine that's very many of you, is a show about the legendary father of Usman I, the founder of the Ottoman Sultanate. Very little is actually known about Ertugrul, except that he paved the way for the nascent Ottoman rule through his heroic commitment to the then Seljuk Empire. Since the fall of Baghdad and the Abbasid Caliphate in 1258, at the hands of Mongolian hordes, the Islamic world was without central leadership, instead falling into several smaller and often competing sultanates. The Ottomans, through their rule, not only reunited these disparate states, but through skill and focus, expanded northwards, liberating Constantinople from the cruel Byzantine Empire. The show's success in the Muslim world leaves many, especially those with liberal leanings, perplexed. Its recent airing in Pakistan has taken the country by storm. Prime Minister Imran Khan has tweeted about the show, suggesting all young Pakistanis can gain a sense of lost Islamic history and a sense of Muslim unity through it. At the same time, Pakistani liberal elites deride the show, bizarrely highlighting on social media the less-than-perfect lifestyles of its cast. Saudi Arabia has banned the show, citing its malign influence, and Egypt's High Fatwa Council, Dar al Ifta, published a statement that accuses Turkey of trying to create an area of influence for itself in the Middle East via its soft power. Saudi Arabia has undertaken a broader initiative to undercut Turkish influence, recently changing its education curriculum to depict the Ottoman rule as an occupation. The show, produced by Turkish filmmakers over five high-octane seasons, fictionalizes the life and travails of Ertuğrul Ghazi and his Kayi tribe and its sometimes uneasy relationship with Seljuk officials as they jostle for power, but also with Christian crusaders and Mongolian marauders as they plot to gain dominion over Muslim territories. Some say it is the Muslim answer to the Game of Thrones, with its choreographed battle scenes, and others liken it to an Islamic political drama, with its focus on hypocrisy within the machinations of power-hungry princes that construct elaborate plans to undermine Muslim unity. In many ways, the show can be a parable for our predicament today, a fractious Muslim world rife with internal conflict, with a leadership more interested in serving Western hegemonic powers than pursuing policies to further Muslim unity and progress. It is hard to criticise the show, but one cannot divorce its aims from that of the Turkish state embarked upon a soft power initiative. President Erdogan looks to ride the wave of pan-Islamism in the Muslim world, capitalising upon the discontent Arab and Muslim masses have shown for their leaderships. Is the show a part of a cultural offensive, and if so, has it been utilised for more nefarious political ends? To discuss the show and its cultural and geopolitical impact, I've invited two Muslim commentators that would look pretty trendy in an Ertuğrul hat, and have long carried around with them a wooden spoon inside their blazers on the off chance they would be invited to a post-lockdown feast. My guests today come to the show from differing perspectives. Dili Hussein is the editor of the online independent news platform Five Pillars. Dili is a fierce advocate for Muslim concerns and is often seen on mainstream television debating with the great and not so good, often swimming against the tide of popular opinion. He's also the presenter of the Blood Brothers podcast. Imran Munir can only be described as a trailblazer in Muslim podcasting. He began the Mad Mamluk some years back, and it's probably the longest-standing Muslim podcast to date. Also known by his nom de guerre Sim, he cuts through the complexities of Muslim discourse with his searching style and trademark wit. I welcome you both to my more humble podcast. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah jalal. 
And it's great to have you with us, uh, Dili and uh, Imran. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. It's an honor to be here, my dear brother. It's an honor to be on your podcast, the Muslim thinking or the thinking Muslim podcast. The honor is truly ours. What's the uh, Arabic translation of that? Fikr or something? I suppose it's Al Fikr Muslimin podcast. Uh, Dili, what's the Arabic for podcast? Uh, Al Podcastia. <laughs> Throw an ia at the end of any, any Arabic word you don't know. Uh, so, so welcome, to, welcome to my podcast. And uh, I understand, uh, Imran, you've uh, uh, you've graced uh, British soil before. You were here recently, were you? Yes, yes. Uh, recently, I've been uh, with the, my friend uh, over here, Dili Hussein, at uh, Bedford, and later we went to your stomping grounds, Luton. Lutonistan, yes, yeah. Luton Shire. No, it's not a Shire. It's not a Shire. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. Not a shy. It's Dilly's very passionate about not calling other surrounding cities of Bedfordshire Shire at the end. And uh, I've invited you here to to talk about the show Erdogan and its uh, its impact. I suppose its cultural as well as its political impact. And I, maybe that's a good place to start. I mean, what is it about Erdogan that has proved so popular? Um, I mean, I can't think of a single show that's unashamedly Islamic and Muslim uh, but has such a wide audience. Um, Imran, I mean, what, what, what is it about the show that's, that's made it so popular, do you think? My belief is that there's a prevailing sense of wanting a noble leader, a hero in the world that works in the advancements of Muslim interests. So I really feel that there is a prevailing sense among the Muslim world, among the practicing Muslim communities, that uh, we want someone who can actually fight for things that we are passionate about. And I think that show has utilized things from the Sira and various other stories that can um, pull together its storyline and show so many different uh, elements uh, related to the faith and connected to the story and connected to the overall situation that Muslims are in today. Dilwar, isn't it astonishing that a show like Erdogan has had such wide appreciation amongst so many diverse Muslims? I mean, if we were talking 10 years back, would we have imagined a show like Erdogan that would be so widely watched and so widely appreciated? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. So the show Dillish Ertolun, uh, even though that's the crux of today's discussion, was released in uh, kind of in, in alignment with a number of other Ottoman shows or Ot Ottoman-based shows, right? And the first season aired, I think, 2013 or 14. And you're, you're right. I mean, I, I echo exactly what Sim said. Uh, five, six, seven years ago, you would never would have imagined a show like Dillish Ertolun and Clearly, it's empowered Muslims around the world, right? Turkey is a different story, which I hope we can get into later on in the podcast. But Muslims yeah. outside of Turkey, you know, they feel empowered. For once, they're watching a show where the Muslims are the heroes. Islam isn't being demonized. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's a sense of unity and, and all kinds of other Islamic themes and principles and ethics and values that are being positively displayed. And I think for that alone, uh, Turkey and... Uh, the AK Party and Mr. Erdogan have to be given that bit of credit, right? That they, under their administration, that such shows uh, were coming out. Uh, and you're right, five, six, seven, eight years ago, especially in light of the war on terror, post 9 11, post 7 7, you would have never imagined uh, a show like the Rish uh, to have ever been uh, not just, you know, produced, but to have gained such worldwide uh, support and significance to the extent where even like the Venezuelan. Uh, Maduro, President, yeah, was was a massive fan of the show, and there were many non-Muslims. Even the fact that it's been compared to Game of Thrones, which, by the way, I unequivocally disagree with. I think that's a a very lazy comparison that was initially made by the Metro newspaper. Um, but the very fact that it's been compared to Game of Thrones, which arguably is one of the greatest TV shows uh, ever made, putting aside its kind of all the other issues with it, the very fact that it's been even been compared as a Muslim version of it. Uh, shows that how mainstream the show has actually become. I mean, Imran, you know, we uh, we we live in a world where Muslim role models are in short supply, and and um, 
uh, air tool, I suppose, fits that vacuum. You were talking about a vacuum before that air tool seems to seems to occupy. Well, yeah. Uh, if you think about, you know, if you remember your teenage years, maybe not you. You seem like a well adjusted young man who <laughs> wouldn't have really upset his parents. But when when you when you're a, a, a Beharat like me, uh, someone who really got my parents upset about everything I was doing when I was young, you kind of connect with uh, the Arthurul character as he's struggling to convince his elders about his mission, his purpose, uh, and the and how it aligns with the overall community's purpose and how he's trying to get everyone to realize that it's not his purpose, but he's actually trying to improve the condition of the society of, of the the tribe itself, right? So, <clears throat> anyone who grew up, grew up uh, passionate about anything, whatever dreams or visions they had, I think uh, they they found uh, something something deeply resonated with with that character and and them. And Dilwar, I mean, many young people consume the program, and uh, I suppose the contemporary view is that uh, liberal culture has dominated. Uh, our youth and uh, many young people uh, have embraced uh, liberal culture and its music scene and its cultural values. But Ertuhul in many ways works against those liberal values. I mean, just imagine a show uh, that looks at men and women relationships very much from an Islamic perspective that depicts battle scenes uh, pretty on PC, I would say, for a, a modern audience. Yet it is so widely consumed. I mean... Yeah, mostly some of the many of the values uh, and principles that have been conveyed consistently throughout the show and the five series, you could easily and, and substantiate that. Yeah, it goes against the kind of predominant secular liberal values uh, that are accepted widely as a norm. And if you don't conform to those values, you're seen as someone who's either uh, you know, rigid or aggressive or backward. However, that said. I want to add just two points. One in response to uh, Sim, where he said, you know, if you were a you know a troublesome, rebellious child uh, growing up, uh, that you know the show kind of fulfills uh, what a a, a model uh, Muslim should be. I'd I'd go, I'd take it a step further. I'd say that look, after 19 years of the war on terror, where Muslims have been perpetually perceived and, and shown as a backward, regressive, otherized, uh, uncivilized uh, people, right? Uh, lands have been ravaged by war and political destabilization and, and all kind of madness, all the way from Morocco, all the way to Indonesia. Just madness happening everywhere. And then everywhere you see on Hollywood and mainstream uh, TV programs, that for once, for once we can now see a handsome, strong, positive, you know, empowered Muslim going and killing off these crusaders, yeah, and fighting the Mongols. That's the truth of it. I am speaking to people from my own town, Jalan, yeah, from Bedford, drug dealers, gangsters, bad boys, even some brothers up in Luton who aren't exactly practicing Muslims. They watch the Dilish Ertul and I ask them, why do you guys like the show? Some of you guys don't even pray. Some of you guys live very bad lifestyles. They go, ah, you know what, Wallahi, you know, for years and years and years, our lands have, you know, we see Muslims getting killed, we're getting our sisters seeing oppressed, we always see Muslims are terrorists and rapists and groomers, and for once we now have a show where, you know what, it's being presented that, you know, we've got this guy called Dilish Ertul, they don't even know who Ertul is, by the way, yeah? And that, this guy called Ertul, and he's killing off these crusaders, and we know that we were always told that the crusaders took Jerusalem, and they're fighting the Mongols. So it's just, it's literally just empowering and giving that confidence uh, to Muslims of all stripes and colours that, you know what, there is a huge positive slant on our history uh, and for once from the from the from the depiction of this show it puts muslim islam and muslims in a very positive light right that's the first point second point and i, and I literally mean that just the very fact that ertrul was seen fighting 16 crusaders without getting a single scratch you know just, just that itself right it's, 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 it's a huge thing on, on, on the muslim psyche especially at a time when films and programs and social media and all these kind of things heavily influence the way we think and, and, and understand and perceive and understand and interpret events and so forth. Secondly, whilst there are consistent Islamic themes and values and principles throughout the entirety of the show, 
it still has been championed by secular liberal elements within Turkey at least. So the way Heymana is presented, the way uh, Aslahan Hatun is presented, the way um, some of the most prominent female uh, characters are, are, are depicted in the show, you know, they've been championed by some of the most ardent feminists in Turkey, right? The fact right. that, the fact that uh, you know, there was a kind of uh, conflict between the Seljuk state, which was ethnically Turk, and the Ayyubid state, which was kind of the leadership, at least was ethnically Kurdish, has been, has been championed by uh, ardent Turkish nationalists. So whilst, yes, there has been Islamic themes consistently portrayed throughout the show, that doesn't necessarily mean that those, whatever's been depicted, hasn't been taken and capitalized by different constituencies, at least within Turkey, that are clearly not Islamic. Well, actually, let me pick up on a point you just mentioned there. Um, is one of the appeals of the show just how much of a parable you can make with the present? Now, you've, you've mentioned how some who've got uh, liberal leanings, who've got secular, a secular agenda, they utilize the show for their own ends. But I'm thinking very much about um, Muslims who see uh, the sense of hopelessness, the corruption, the division, the disunity that exists at the moment in the Muslim Ummah. Uh, is one of the appeals of the show, Imran, just how much we can draw parallels between the past and the present? Absolutely. If you, um, if anyone who studied history knows the situation that the Muslim world is in during that show, it's, uh, you know, it's very much ravaged. It's uh, the Ayyubids, there's the... Uh, uh, Abbasids, you know, you know, all Seljuks, they're all like divided. Everyone's scattered. They're, they're being attacked from every front. And I think the parallel you could draw is that something, you know, a moment that I, that happened to me when I was young, when I was seeing the, the Muslim world and history books, as I was turning the pages, I would see, you know, the Muslim world completely united at various elements in history. And then you see all of a sudden, all these different countries all across the world and you're like what happened uh did what, what what do you think of uh, make of that point i mean is there a parallel it is the appeal of the show uh, just how how much of a connection you can draw between the past and the present i think we need to be mindful and i've written about this extensively in three articles article number one understanding the caliphate between cynicism and romanticism article number two understanding the revival of ottoman ottomanism in turkish tv and article number three which is 10 facts for the Dalish ethical fans where i spoke about whilst we can draw correlation between uh, some of the socio-political realities of treachery um, you know internal views disunity etc that's been depicted in the show and our current reality we need to be very very mindful that we don't compare the situation uh, too much because even though the situation of the Muslim world in the late to mid 12th 13th century was not great however there was still a level of independence even though there wasn't let's say one unified caliphate yeah we had the Seljuk yeah. Empire we had the Ayyubid dynasty by the way both of whom who had ceremoniously given bay'ah to the Abbasid Caliph um, of, of Baghdad yeah Yes, yes, lest we also forget that the Mamluks... The, the Seljuks didn't, though, right? They did. They absolutely did. They absolutely did. There wasn't, there, there was, there wasn't a single Sunni dynasty that didn't give bay'ah nominally and ceremoniously to the Abbasids. There wasn't a single dynasty. Whether it was the Ayyubids, whether it was the Mamluks, whether it was the Seljuks, they all gave ceremonial bay'ah to the, to the Abbasid Khulafa, even though they were without a shadow of that independent autonomous entities that were actually significantly greater than the Abbasid Caliphate, which barely extended beyond Mesopotamia. In fact, if they wanted to at will, they could have just gone into Baghdad and taken it. But, but, the, but they respected certain rulings and hukums in place, uh, and they just carried on doing what they did. They had their own treasury, they had their own armies, etc., etc. And they and, and they do things like, if they went to battle, they'll get a ceremonious declaration from the Abbasid Caliph, and that was literally by it. So but the point I'm trying to make here is, I don't think we can make an exact correlation at all with our current reality today and the past century which is distinctly unique compared to any other period in islamic history to that of the 12th and 13th century muslim world because whilst during the 12th and 13th century 
we did have the Crusades, we did have the Mongol hordes coming and, and ravaging the Muslim world. However, there were still numerous attempts by, by a number of dynasties to repel that, to seek unity, and to establish the deen of Islam uh, in those respective lands. Whereas here, in, the, in 2019, and for the best part of 100 years, that's not been the case. We've got 57 secular nation states, right? Most of whom, if not all of them, uh, are subservient slaves to either America, Russia, or China, and are held by the cojones by IMF and World Bank loans. You can't compare those two realities. There is no attempt whatsoever amongst the existing leadership to do anything about the, the apathetic and dire situation of the Ummah. The themes of treachery, the themes of disunity, the themes of power struggle has always been there within Islamic history. Even mm -hmm. the period of the Umayyads right through to the Ottoman period, we've always had these instances of power struggles and so forth. However, the, the situation today is, is distinctly unique. And whilst we can, we can take lessons and, 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 and correlations between what was depicted in the show and our situation today, the situation today is significantly far worse. You know, one, one, one quick point I want to add. While Dilly's correct, are, the political realities are, are very much different. I think the show assists a lot of laymen, uh, young Muslims, what have you, to understand how to, I mean, so, so when you look at um, art in the c cinema format, or it, it's a much more exaggerated a representation of what political realities are, but the, the show shows Agreed. or makes a great display of how even people with good intentions or what we would consider good, they have um, an element of uh, human ambition, power, wealth affecting them and trying to, and how that those, those poisons can affect their mind and affect uh, the advancement of uh, the people itself. So you see these very selms, even the, the main worst enemy in the show, Saladin Kobek, even he has reverence and, and loyalties towards Islam, but he's affected really very much so by this ambitious nature of his, uh, where you know he's very much wanting to gain power and wealth and status and uh, being affected by that. So. Certainly, Dubar. I think I get your point when you say that there's no perfect version of Islamic history and, and the parallels, at least in the macro themes, uh, can't quite be made with the dire situation of the Muslim world today. But the micro themes, I mean, just pick up on uh, something that, uh, Sim, you just said there about uh, the uh, the jostling for power. I mean, Saadat in Quebec is, is a good example of that. And uh, can you look at Saadat in Quebec and not draw some connections with some of the Muslim leaders today? Um, look, I, I think for those of you uh, who have read or done some research into Seljuk history, I know about Amir Saadat in Quebec. Um, he was, according to his own uh, contemporaries and what was written about him, he was a very, very nefarious individual, uh, responsible for the deaths of a number of princes. Uh, and he even died a wicked death as well. Um, so, but, but look, I, I digress. The point I'm trying to make is that, sure, there are themes within the show which we can relate to and apply to our reality. The problem I find is that we cannot make or even try to even attempt to make exact correlations or, or even, even trying to level them to the same degree. Because, as I've already mentioned, there were always power struggles within Islamic dynasties and Islamic civilization. There were always power struggles. There were always uh, opportunist characters who felt that by them uh, uh, attaining power, wealth, that they would, they would deliver something better for their respective state or civilization. The point I guess I'm trying to make is that if you were to, let's say, take the example of Crown, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, would it be accurate to compare him to Saadat in Kopek or to even like, yeah, fine, we can, we can say that, look, there's some comparisons between uh, how the show depicts uh, Kopek and, and Crown, Crown uh, Prince MBS, but it, it's just not realistic because you have mm -hmm. to understand the environment which we're currently in and the environment which Kopek was in. And no matter how bad Kopek was, he still had an uh, utmost uh, allegiance to the Seljuk state. And whatever he did, 
he did for the betterment advancement for the Seljuk state from an expansionist point of view, whereas Crown Prince MBS certainly is not doing that. Um, look, I think, I think it's subjective. I think that a lot of it's subjective. You can take these themes, you can take these themes and apply it to your work office. You can take these themes and apply it to your family politics. You can take these themes and apply it to most realities. All I'm saying is, for the listeners, is that we just need to be mindful that we, where we don't uh, try taking those themes and, and, and thinking, you know what, we're living at a time of Dirilish Ertrul. Because we're not. We're living in a far worse situation. A far worse. And we also need to be mindful. You speak to anyone in Turkey and ask them, who, uh, who, who do you uh, envisage as Ertuğrul in the show? They'll say to you, Erdogan. They'll say it to you. And we ask someone, have you watched Peytat Abdul Hamid, another very well-known uh, show about the life of Sultan Abdul Hamid? Ask the people in Turkey, the secularists and the Muslims, and everyone else in between, who do you think this show is trying to depict? They'll say to you, oh, it's uh, Erdogan. And who are these sellouts? Who are these Europeans? The EU, America, and so forth. Who are the internal traitors? That's the Gulenists. That is how Turks are, are interpreting the show. That's not how Muslims outside of Turkey are, are, are interpreting the show. And this is why in the last year, year and a half, I would say I'm starting to become a bit more, not cynical, I'm taking a bit more kind of not so uh, zealous uh, approach to the show like I was when I first started watching. I first started watching the show three, four years ago. Right? I started writing about the show two, three years ago. Uh, and I'm not as passionate and zealous about the show as I once was. Whilst I appreciate it. Are you becoming a ghoulinist? No, no, no. What I'm trying to say is that, that whilst I appreciate the show has done significantly more good than bad, I just say Muslims just need to take a reality check, especially those, especially the practicing Muslims, not the lay Muslims who are watching the shows, our mums, our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, the, the street guys, the laymen. I'm talking about those who are practicing Muslims. We just need to calm down, relax and understand that the Turks themselves do not see these shows as some kind of um, um, coming, um, a coming of a, of, of a caliphate or, or, an, or a revival of the Ottoman state. They see this show as the AK party, Erdogan, and, some, and his own trials and tribulations and his political campaign and, and some of the things that he's experienced. For example, the, the coup attempts, the coup attempts in season one. Yeah, you, you know, so many Turks know it. That's referring to the, the failed coup attempt of 2016, right? Um, all, all the sellouts in the Ke tribe, right? Who are they seeing? They're presented as Gulenists. So what I'm saying is that we just need to be mindful of two things, not to compare the reality of then to the reality of now. It's so important. Yes, we take those lessons, we take those themes, but we can never say that, you know what, the situation then was like the situation of now. I will stand by firm with anyone who I've engaged with, Muslim or non-Muslim, you cannot compare the situation of the Muslim Dilly, here's the, here's the thing. Yeah, here's sorry. The thing. Sorry, 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 sorry. Just, and just a second point, bro. And the second point is that we need to appreciate, we need to understand how the Turks themselves perceive this show. Because they're the ones that produce the show. So we need to understand, when I, when I visited Turkey, I realized, oh, okay, not everyone sees this as some kind of Islamic revivalist show. They don't. Not everyone does. The Turkish nationalists have an interpretation of the show. The feminists have an interpretation of the show. Uh, the kind of um, pro-Muslim Democrats have an interpretation of the show. Whereas outside of Turkey, everyone seems to have a kind of consistent understanding of this show. And that is, we interpret this show as we need a Muslim hero to unify the Muslim world, fight off our enemies and establish a system which is based on justice. Whereas the Turks don't necessarily see it like that. Imran, yeah. So my, my, what I'm trying to say is that you're, you're correct about the, the various political realities are completely different, but the same elements are present in every political reality. And they'll continue example, to be. Yeah, like, like for example, agents or actors who work against the best interests of Islam and Muslims, they have, they have always existed through the beginning of Islamic history. And, there's, and they so, will continue to do so. And we, yes, and they will continue to do so. And I think the show does a wonderful job of highlighting that aspect for I agree. at least those who, and even though, yes, you're, you're correct about the various interpretations of the show among Turkish society, but I think when the uh, regular Muslim sees it that exists outside of Turkey, they, that's the immediate connections they make. They, they're seeing someone who, is, who has their uh, interests, their, their, their foundation, all their actions that are, are sprouting from the faith, from Islam, and they're seeing how various elements of politics that can affect or stop 
the advancement of the faith. You're absolutely right, Sim, that yes, the layman, the, 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 the average Muslim will see that show and it's important they understand it that these different mechanisms and these kind of different agents are at play that are always constantly, day and night, are trying to bring down the unity of Islam and Muslims, as well as any kind of uh, uh, self-determination of the Muslim majority world. I just think it's also important to bring Turks and actually us Muslims outside of Turkey to actually educate our Turkish brothers and sisters that, hey guys, whilst you guys may think that this is some kind of depiction of uh, Erdogan's political campaign in Korea, the rest of the Muslim world see the show like this and maybe you guys need to listen to us and understand that this perhaps is how the show should be seen. Dilara, to, to what extent is, is this purposeful? Um, you know, we, we've known for some time that the Turkish government has had a very uh, heavy program of um, uh, expanding its soft power projection around the world. And um, it sees uh, a number of these shows, uh, as you quite rightly described, a number of these shows are seen within that gambit, right? You know, it's it's the Turkish state projecting its influence in in largely Muslim countries, but but also beyond those countries. And and to what extent is Ertuğrul uh, a show that not only is it the consequence of the show that uh, some Turkish nationalists have picked up on it for their own political ends, and Erdogan supporters see a parallel between Erdogan and, and Ertuğrul. Uh, but 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 even further, is is Ertug, Ertugul a an instrument of Turkish soft power? Hundred percent, without a shadow of a doubt. I spoke about this in my extensive article published in the Foreign Policy Journal, where, where I actually spoke about Turkish drama and Ottoman TV series as being used as part of Turkish foreign policy in the Muslim world. Um, we can't deny that Turkey has a warm spot, it has a warm space in, in the heart and minds of the Muslims, in the, generally in the Muslim world, right? My Nana, who's passed away, he would have been 90 something by now, he knew about Turishkan, yeah, in Bengali Turishkan, oh yes, uh, the, the Muslim rulers of Turishkan, right? We know about the many um, movements that were born in the Indian subcontinent uh, that worked effortlessly and tirelessly to keep the Ottoman state alive, right? Uh, we know that even uh, the NBC in, 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 in uh, Saudi and the UAE are now producing their own show to counter the British Ertrul. But the thing about the British Ertrul and, and not just the British Ertrul, Peytat Abdul Hamid, um, uh, Kutle Amare, Mehmet Chik, Nakrulus Osman, loads of these shows. Lo it's not just the British Ertrul, it's loads of these shows that are now being kind of aired in, in, in the Muslim majority world, they're being translated into Urdu, into Persian, into Arabic and so forth. And what that's actually doing is that it's kind of, it's, it's, it's softening the hearts and minds of those Muslim countries that Turkey, when it tries to engage their countries, is doing so from a position of unity on, on a basis of Muslim brotherhood and so forth. And it's actually working quite successfully. It's worked quite successfully in Somalia, in Sudan, uh, in other parts of Central Asia, in Azerbaijan, uh, in the Caucasus region, in Bosnia, it's working very well. What it's doing is that it's, 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 it's conveying a positive impact from a, from a public relations view, at least, that look, Erdogan uh, or Turkey under the AK Party and Erdogan specifically uh, is coming to, to strengthen these relationships uh, with your respective countries, whether it be economy or politics, social, wherever the deals may be, that these, 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 the strengthening of these state-to-state -state relationships is coming from a perspective of the descendants and the progeny of the Ottomans. And shows like this help with that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, perception that, that Muslims outside of Turkey, especially non-Turks, will have of, of Erdogan and, and, and his government. S Sim, Sim, what, what, what's your take on this? Do you think um, Delwar is going a bit too far here in, in, in assessing the... Um, the demerits of the show. Well, um, I think w what I what I measure is the actual effect of the show. It you know whether whenever you read any articles or, or any ideas, uh, whether it's from academia or or from art, you you ha you would be remiss if you did not measure the effect of the show. The effect of the show. I, I don't think Billy's discounting it. I think it's it's the effect what. What you have to measure, yes, the Ak Party and all these other various elements within Turkey are, are are utilizing the show for their own benefit and what have you. But 
the effect of the show has in my estimation in, in all the various experiences I've had or engagements I've had with various listeners of the show have all been uh, in the advancement of Islam and Muslims and the uh, importance of Muslims recognizing that they're, they need their own political entity that represents Muslim political interests or Islam's political interests. So I, I think that is the effect I measure. And I think Billy would agree with this as, as well, would you? I would, yeah, definitely. I would agree with you. But, but depending on who you speak to, Sim, as well, bro. Like, for example, and, and Jalal, maybe you can kind of get where I'm coming from. When you start seeing individuals who are very close to the British establishment and played a key role in putting together and advocating for draconian Islamophobic counterterrorism laws, supporting strategies like Prevent, championing the show, you wonder to yourself, is everyone really understanding, uh, is, ever, is everyone more or less on the same page? I don't think they are. I don't want to mention any, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to mention any names, but you, Sim, you're right, by yeah. the way. No, no, Generally you're, you're right as well, because I've seen, I've seen speak. feminists take that show and various elements of the Habibi, I've, and, I've, and, Habibi, I've, I've, Habibi, I've seen American du'at and scholars, very well-known celebrity scholars, that have all got their KE hats on. Now they've got their Habib and um, Numagamedov hats on, right? And they're just jumping onto a, a trend, bro, a popular trend. But, but, but tell them to speak about accounting to, to tyrannical rulers and oppressive regimes. Tell them to talk about uh, Islamic unity, whether it be, forget about the caliphate. Let's put that aside, because that's like a next level discussion. Let's even talk about the, the potential of a, any form of actual Muslim unity where the economy and the resources and the military uh, numbers and power that we have can be utilized together in a coordinated manner, independent of the five UN security members, right? Of whom we're- Dilly, Dilly, Dilly. well, let's take it, take it even one step down. Let's talk about just being principled in, in whatever you believe in so yes. that you're, you're uncompromising. That yes. would be the yes. prevailing uh, message throughout the show is, you know, stand your ground. Don't, don't, you know, don't be so willing to negotiate everything and don't be so willing to bend over backwards so that you can be accepted by um, various enemies of the state, you know? So that, that, that that's, even that is being completely ignored by many leaders. Yeah, yeah. so, so I, th I, I think that was generally speaking, you can speak to most Muslims, right? And again, there's no data to substantiate. I'm talking about from my personal interactions with, with people of different levels and different backgrounds inside of the UK, outside of the UK. That yes, when you speak to them about Dillish Ertrul, the three or four themes that are born out of it is that we need a strong, principled Islamic ruler who will work towards unifying the Muslim lands and the Muslim people, will establish an entity or a polity that will rule from the justice of Islam, and number four, will fight and repel our enemies. Generally speaking, you speak to most Muslims, they will tell you these four themes in their own way. But I have a problem with the fact that a number of prominent Muslims, whether it be Tu'at, whether it be Ulama, whether, whoever it may be, that they are also championing this show and sadly they do not demonstrate anything that is characteristic of, of Ertrul as depicted in the show. And that's very disheartening and it's just reflective of people just jumping on a bandwagon and a hype. Secondly, it's important also to understand those four things that I've just mentioned can also mean different things to different people, right? For many people, and we know this already, that Erdogan is perhaps the most popular Muslim ruler from the Muslim majority world. Can we all at least agree on that? Hmm. Do, you, yeah. do you guys agree with me? Yeah, yeah of, course. of course. Yeah, so he's the, he's the most championed, the most celebrated Muslim ruler that we currently have. So, and what so and what happens then is, Jalal, sorry, what happens then is we tend to forget his many, many faults. And then when you talk about Islamic or Muslim unity, people will then, people can interpret it as, oh, we just need a stronger Arab League or we just need a stronger OIC, right? So these yeah. four things mean different things to different people, right? Hardcore Muslims like you and I, Sim, may interpret it as such. But speak to other Muslims of different stripes and colors, bro. They'll tell you yeah. that maybe the existing framework is okay. We just need to tweak it a little bit. And you know what? Voila, we have a Dillish Ertrul situation. I mean, Absolutely. you know, right. I, I, I tend to agree with you, Ferdilwar. And, and um, maybe it is the case that Erdogan tends to get a free ride when it comes to criticism, right? You know, the, the same 
level of criticism we would apply to most Muslim rulers would would tend to not uh, fall uh, Erdogan's way. And um, I mean, just look at his actions in northeastern Syria uh, over the last couple of months. And, um, you know, it's reprehensible in what is what is achieved and what he's done and 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 the impact that's had on uh, the the little rebellion that was left in in the Syrian civil war and and um, uh, he's effectively allowed and enabled uh, Assad uh, to take great swathes of land that had been prohibited to him for for a good number of years um, and so uh, yet I don't find and you're right you know that that criticism of Erdogan is not uh, as that chorus of criticism you get for all of the Muslim leaders tends not to go Erdogan's way. And, and I suppose your argument is an interesting one. Could that possibly be so because shows like Erdogan may be utilized as an instrument of, of Turkish soft power? I mean, Jalba, I mean, I mean, look, you cited Syria, right? But there's so many other examples. For example, here, uh, Erdogan's uh, consistent mentioning of Al-Quds and Jerusalem and how noble and how central it is to the, to the Muslim people. But it is his administration that has had the most record break deals, economic deals with Israel. Right. There's, you know, the fact that he himself has also been involved in sending Uyghur Muslims back to China to be put into concentration camps. And also, you know, the, the list is endless. But the, the, so it is dangerous. It is dangerous that just in the look, it can work both ways, and I think generally speaking, it's more so positive than negative. Because if if someone came to me and said, "Look, right, Tilly, Turkish Ertel and other Turkish Ottoman programs are being aired all around the Muslim world, and generally these are the four themes that people are getting out of it: a need for a strong leadership, Muslim unity, our own state, and political self determination, and repelling and fighting our enemies." Just the very fact that we can even have that conversation and people are thinking about that is much better than how this, these shows can be used um, to a negative impact by Turkish soft power by giving Erdogan and his administration a free pass. So if given the choice, I think the positives significantly outweigh the negatives, but we can't just ignore the negatives. The negative is the negative. And just because Dilish Ertul and these other shows are doing are doing wonderfully in, in kind of culturally awakening some of these discussion and themes and values within the Muslim psyche. I totally agree with you with, with Dili, and I think it underscores of course the importance of people like us, uh, Dili, uh, Jalal, everyone who is involved in, in Dawah and in, in public Dawah, to connect shows like this to uh, the faith and create the narrative. So I think there's, there's, there's elements within our duat who are uh, working to, uh, you know, belittle the show because it's of its historical inaccuracies. And that's what, what really bothers me that, you know, many of our own, you know, Islamic historians and scholars, people who are involved in um, learning about what Ottoman history was, the, the, you know, they're kind of poo-pooing the show, saying that, oh, you know, this is inaccurate. This is, like, we get it. You know, there, there's a story. They're, they're filling in a lot of blanks. There wasn't recorded history. And that's what what I'm, what really upsets me. If, if, I, if, I can just, if I can just say, look, uh, for, for, the, for the listeners out there, one of my teachers uh, and mentors when it comes to Ottoman history is Dr. Yaqub Ahmed. Yeah, he's based in Istanbul. And he teaches Ottoman history. He's a South Londoner of Pakistani origin, right? Yeah. And 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 he is one of the most uh, erudite and celebrated scholars uh, on when it comes to Ottoman history. And he himself said to me during my last visit, and I'm paraphrasing this this conversation I had. He says that look, the show itself never claimed to be factually correct. It actually it actually says that this is a fictionalized version of of Ertuğrul um, uh, Aziz's uh, life. Right. And I even write in my many pieces that whilst the skirmishes and the dramas and all of that is fictionalized, the general historical context and timing and chronology is absolutely accurate. Number two, you made a very good point, Sim, about, you know, some of the art, you know, kind of trying to kind of like belittle the show and trying to some of you even compared it to Bollywood, believe it or not. Right. Yeah. I've even heard some say that the, the women that are dressed in the show and not wearing proper hijab and stuff. I've, I've, I've had all these arguments. I, I think, isn't it fair to say, Dilwar, that um, 
what what you're describing is a broader problem, and that is a lack of uh, you know political literacy, a lack of political awareness that exists in in the Muslim Ummah. Well, I think I think Jalal, I think uh, many times people who are academics who are learned, they they. You ever you ever meet people who read a book and then they see the movie and then they make fun of the movie how how inaccurate it is compared to the, to the book. This is how these guys are. They, they we get it, guys. We get it. You studied, you know, and they use that opportunity to kind of flex their their intellectual capabilities, their academia, their, their whatever they learned, like. So you know what I'm you know what I'm saying is like, slow down and and try to understand what the what the overall uh, message what the what the show is trying to convey to people you know and but I suppose Dilwar you know Imran Imran's point is is very valid but um, y you know in a sense it's a it's a a a, a program that's uh, on TV and and it's interpreted by different people often based on their inbuilt prejudices and biases and and maybe then it is a case of of um, you know using opportunities like this to uh, refashion the the narrative and and to to claim our history and um, and to as you said you know as to draw parallels if 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 one can draw parallels between uh, those forces that uh, Erhul the, the historical character was up against and and similar forces that exist today that, that, that look when I've when I've written about this show uh, and other Ottoman shows I have had to give credit to the Akbar administration, because it is under their administration that shows like this are being produced. This would have been unforeseeable 15 years ago. You could have got hanged, you, you could have got killed as a leader if you were to have produced a show like this. So the very fact that they've allowed some kind of loosening and some kind of uh, you know freedom to actually discuss Ottoman history, something which was for decades banned, because Ottoman history became synonymous with Islam under the Kamali state, right? But I think the very fact that, you know, Erdogan and the AK Party and others that get a free pass for what they do is also reflective of another issue. It's reflective of an inferiority complex that we have when it comes to a leadership crisis. Hence why when Nelson Mandela passed away, when she, that's why we find many Muslims celebrating Che Guerrera, uh, Hugo Chavez, it's just, it just seems that the Muslims are, many Muslims are just so desperate, so desperate, for any kind of leader, anyone to show something positive to Islam and Muslims, and literally this person will be put on a pedestal and we'll march him down the roads on our shoulders. Uh, it's interesting you, you mentioned that, Dili, because I grew up idolizing, you know, guys like Che Guevara, and much of my influence, even to this day, is impacted by many of the things I've learned from just studying his life. You know, um, yeah, bro, I'm so bro, I'm uh, uh, this thing. No, 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 no. I'm saying, I'm saying, this shows like this present an alternative to young Muslims, mm -hmm. so that an ideologue like Che Guevara, who comes from a foreign, a foreign ideology that's completely antithetical to our our belief system, you know, Alhamdulillah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala guided me, but um, many other Muslims, uh, you know, fall into this trap of idolizing other people from from various other ideologies and and beliefs. I want to posit this: How many the, people? And again, there's no data to back this. It would actually be an interesting piece of research if everyone had the time and resource. How many people who watch the show, Dirilish Ertrul, and most likely Krulus Osman now, how many people watch it just because as a Muslim-friendly entertainment? How many people watch it ideologically to fulfill some kind of vacuum within themselves and within their families that, you know, we need some kind of Islamic entertainment or some kind of pro-Muslim entertainment? How many Muslims are going to watch this program and actually go on to do further research into Ottoman history? You're absolutely right. So there's certain personalities, certain types of characteristics within people that are um, more conducive to being uh, impacted by you know various types of historical figures or any other in, you know inspiring individuals. But it's important that our our historical figures get the attention that they deserve, so that uh the correct framework is built around the young muslim mind you know and even, even even if like 10 people or six people in a household are watching the show and you multiply that by 100 maybe one of those 
in one of those households or two of those households, there's a young child watching that show and, it, you know, it makes a deep connection to that show and it changes the course of his life, you know? So No, I, I, I tend to agree with, you, with, with, with the two of you. And, and Imran, your point is, is very valid. Undoubtedly, I mean, you know, Atahul is a, is a program on TV, right? And it, it will be interpreted by many t- different people in, in many different ways. And those with nefarious objectives are going to try to claim the program for one objective, objective or another. And, and you're right, you know, Dilwar, when we look at the British context, there are... Uh, you know, very secular Muslim uh, personalities who who champion the show, but you know because they're riding the wave, they they see it as an opportunity to um, uh, to to ride on the back of a, a very popular show which has inspired great numbers of of young Muslims. However, having having said that, I think the show is, you know, it it, it in itself um, the themes that are covered. Uh, and the language used in the show and, and the narrative that comes through, especially as the, the seasons uh, go on, you know, all of that cannot be. It's very difficult to interpret that in a, in a way uh, opposite to, to Islam. I get the high level point you're making about, you know, um, how uh, Muslim leaders at Erdogan will use the show for their own soft power objectives. But there are some uh, some very deliberate, and it seems to me the producers of the show uh, have embedded some very deliberate Islamic characteristics or Islamic notions that will be very hard to sort of to interpret if you if you were to give it a fair interpretation in a in a very secular light. One of the clear uh, threads of the show, I suppose, is you know there are lots of these choreographed battle scenes and very epic battle scenes right you know between the muslims and the crusaders and the muslims and the mongols um you know in in a world where we're being told that uh muslims are are uh, bloodthirsty and terrorists and isis is the only is the vent for this uh these notions of of muslim violence i mean it's refreshing to see a show where you know, as you said, there is a, a just war, but but uh, Fred that comes through in the show. You know, Ertuğrul Ertu never goes beyond the bounds of what is accepted in, in an Islamic context. And he shows chivalry in, in warfare. And, you know, just the very fact that so many non-Muslims watch the show and, and do not draw those parallels with ISIS, I, I think is a testament of how, you know, does attempt to to build some very strong notions of Islamic warfare in, in this in this context. I mean, Imran, I mean, you know, is that something that you you take from it as well? 100%. Uh, I have family members uh, who are Latino and they're Catholics. They're all watching the show and they're, I've even seen not from my family, but uh, uh, they're, plenty of Latinos within South America and whatnot who have connected with the show and have even accepted Islam. I just recently I saw a clip of uh, someone, one of the actors, one of the actors from the show giving Shahada to a Latino member um, uh, from the Latino community. I don't know if it was in the United States. I think it was, right, Dili? Yeah, it's Abdul Rahman Al. Yeah, Abdul Rahman Al. Yeah. So it is de- definitely affecting various um, parts, even out of, in, in the non-Muslim world. So uh, I really think that the the way the show connects Islam to all their actions, to at least you know all the heroes of the show, whether it's you know the the person who's the physician, or who is the uh, you know the blacksmith, or what have you, they're all they're, all their actions are connected to the faith, and it's showing that this is coming from Islam, and it. it there's a clear delineation of what is Islam and what is, uh, you know, the people's own inclinations and, and desires. So I think that that's uh, very well done in the show. Great. Jazakallah khair. Um, I think um, we've covered most of the themes of the show and, and you know, it's a, it's been a terrific discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, Dilwar, I think your point is, is extremely interesting. And um, you, you've met the producers of the show. Is that right, Dilwar? Yes, yeah, so I met um, I met a number of uh, senior guys from behind the show, uh, notably Hussein Oschelik, mm-hmm. uh, who's the corporate communications director of the show. Um, unfortunately, I didn't actually get to meet Mehmed Bozdag, uh, but we did communicate with one another via WhatsApp. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, look, I, f- from what I got from the sh- what, what I f- got from the guys behind the show, the, the people, the very people who produce the show, was that undoubtedly their intention was to instill within the show consistently throughout it was these Islamic concepts of justice, uh, jihad, fi sabilillah, martyrdom, unity, and so forth. But look, you know, off the record conversations with them, uh, there was also some admissions that look, people will interpret these things as and how they wish. Justice, the way we see, like if three of us, if, if me, Jalal and Sim in this very podcast say, right, what is our personification? How do we envisage what a just Islamic polity would be, right? We may, or three of us, or one of us may turn and say, well, a caliphate. Someone will yeah. turn and say, well, no, you know, we think that a, a, a democratic state or a confederate union of certain states, you know, could also be Islamic, could also be a state which runs from, from justice. So others will say no, because, you know, the existing uh, democratic framework isn't necessarily a contradiction with what we understand to be uh, Islamic justice in terms of governance. So I think that's the kind of thing that they were trying to tell me that, look, yes, these are Islamic themes and concepts, but people will naturally interpret them as according to their understanding and their understanding of their faith. It is clear that Ertuğrul has um, inspired great numbers of people. I mean, my my son, uh, to take your point, Dilbar, actually, my, my son who's... Uh, uh, who saw his parents watch this show over a number of months and years, right? Um, uh, he very recently, I mean, this is a, a, you know, a late convert to the show. Very recently, he began to watch it on his train into work. And uh, he was uh, pretty um, amazed by just how how strongly it connected with, with Islam. And he's hooked on, on the show. And this is after a number of years observing his parents, you know, talk talk about the show and have a sort of post show discussion but uh you know and, and and that's for me that's that's a a victory right imran you know that's someone who uh who's taken something from the show in in a very positive way um and and you know that's i think that's the power of the show absolutely and i think that is what we need to do uh, especially just with the mass uh options of uh, entertainment that are available to young Muslims these days, ensuring that they get to watch the show. I, you know, I even bribed my teenage daughters to, you know, drop their phones and uh, watch the show just because, uh, you know, I really feel like they needed to connect with this Islamic identity uh, much more than they are because they're just being constantly bombarded with, you know, social media and, and what have you. So, it's, it's really important that uh, we do whatever you can to get our, our youth uh, to watch the show and have some form of entertainment through that medium. Barakallah feek, inshallah. And uh, thank you for your time today, brothers. And uh, inshallah, we should do this again. We should, uh, inshallah. Inshallah. We inshallah. should discuss inshallah. further. And, uh, uh, Dilwar, and your, um, are we going to see you on, on TV sometime soon? Soon, inshallah. Uh, whenever, whenever, whenever my two pence is needed, uh, I'm sure I'll be called upon. Uh, by the mainstream media but until then i'm kind of focusing on the podcast and for those of you who are listening uh the blood brothers podcast is actually a collaboration between five pillars and the mad mumluks and imran i I think it's fair to say that the mad mumluks is uh, probably the most established muslim podcast that's uh, out there um i think there there was a, a couple before we started um and you know they they kind of uh provided some inspiration um just in terms of uh you know putting our necks out there and and uh doing something i think one of the sis actually it was a couple sisters from australia um uh, they, they had a podcast and that kind of uh gave me some ideas and then there, there were other podcasts that were happening in the mainstream world that uh, really helped uh, me kind of figure out what what format the show should be um, but yeah, alhamdulillah, the, the show has been very successful and, you know, I try my best to help as many other you know, young Muslims who are trying to start a podcast, uh, you know, get their equipment and things in order so that they can start my, well, one of the things that I mentioned earlier was, you know, how, uh, I was inspired by Che Guevara, right? So one of the things Che did was just be selflessly going around the world, you know, all across South America on a motorcycle or whatever and 
and uh, spreading communism, right? And uh, he was a physician. He wasn't a bum, you know. He he was someone who actually studied, and he he was someone who was a very, very uh, high level thinker. And and a lot of people told me like, hey Sim, why don't you you know set up a, a program with with fees and you know make it a uh, a money making effort where you can show people how to podcast and like no this is this, we're not in this you I don't think you understand the gravity of the situation right now that Muslims are in we don't have the luxury of of charging people to spread media you know so it's very important that people who are um, who have interest in in uh, producing content that they do so and that they get the full support of the community behind them. Uh, to facilitate the, their effort, yeah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from you and uh, all of us, inshallah. And Jazakallah uh, khair, brothers, for, for coming on my show today. And uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah.